Welcome to Garden Features. It's a special feature of KNAFAM 910's News Division. We'll be exploring tips and ideas on gardening in the Hill Country. Hi, welcome, Deb. How are you today? I'm well. (laughs) Nice to see you, Trish. So I'm Deborah Simmons, and I'm the president of the uh, Native Plant Society of Texas Fredericksburg chapter. Our chapter here is just people in Gillespie County, and we have 330 members, which is a pretty good-sized chapter for a for a small town. And and so I have been long a lover of native plants, and uh, native has changed as I grew up in California, and then eventually came to Texas. Um, I spent some time in the Houston area, a very different (laughs) microclimate. Um, But we've had a place out here in the Hill Country for 16 years. And so I have come to learn some of the challenges of growing uh, in this difficult climate. And that's what got me interested in in working with native plants. And this is really fun because we do a gardening show on Saturdays with Neil Sperry. And then this is really targeting it much more locally as well to talk about what people who live in Fredericksburg know about it. Today, what we're going to be talking about is pollinators. Now, I know a lot of people when I think pollinators, I think spring, but really it's a year round activity. Is that correct? True. Um, actually, pollinators live year round. <laughs> they want to live year round. They even want to live when there's no pollen. And so, yes, it's and that's a tricky thing here. Um, also, when people think of pollinators, they often think of honeybees. And honeybees are not native there to, to our area. They are native to Europe. And they were brought over on the very first European ships that crossed the Atlantic. Ah. So they've been here a long time, but they're non-native. We've got over 400 species of native bees in the United States, many of them here in our local areas. And we're talking about pollinators, we're talking about bees and wasps, sorry, and mayflies and damselflies and and butterflies and moths and all the little flitting things that eat pollen and nectar. It's, it's It really is fascinating when you think that we have over 400 native bees and there's different ways to keep them welcome, make them welcome in your yard or in your garden area. What do we need to be thinking about? Um, what kind of year-round blooms should we be thinking of? Well, so that's a really important um, that's a really important point, which is since they eat year round and they eat pollen and nectar, the only place pollen and nectar are found is in flowers, which means you have to have flowers all the time. Whenever you don't have flowers, they don't eat. And so that's a really nice thing as a as a, something to aim at in your garden because flowers are really lovely for us too. And so what you want to do is have you think about what's going to bloom in January, what's going to bloom in February, what's going to bloom in March. You go all the way through the calendar and put together um, a a menu so that your pollinator restaurant is offering pollen and nectar all year round. And that's one of the things I find fascinating in these conversations is last time we also talked about how planning and thinking about what's in your yard or not in your yard already is a big part of that when we talked about mapping the yard for what we wanted to do last time. Now it's thinking about month to month the blooms that are there or aren't there, but could be. Yeah, absolutely true. And and you might say, you know, I get, we got all that weedy stuff in April and that's when I got dandelions in the yard. And I said, <laughs> like, whoa, if that's the only thing blooming in your yard, dandelions, the po- they're non-native, but the but the pollinators do really love them. I see, I, I'm a beekeeper as well as a keeper ah, of whoever else flies well, maybe up. Maybe that can be a discussion uh, one time. I'm fascinated by beekeeping. Okay, yeah. we can, yeah, we can absolutely talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, but blooming year round is, is one of the things that really matters uh, for pollinators. And just another a little side note on that is, of course, everyone knows that the European honeybees make honey. Well, why do they do that? Well, they make it so they have something to eat when there's nothing blooming. It carries Ah. them through the downtime. Well, a lot of our native bees don't have that. And they don't have so much of a ability to have reserves and set up stores. And so we need to think about that for them. And yeah, Ah, I never thought about that. I never thought about that. I always assumed if it was a bee, it was going to have honey, but that's not true. There's different kinds of bees that do different kinds Mm -hmm. of things, but they all All Um, So there are different shapes to the, I guess you would call it the faces of uh, of the pollinators. Um, does that affect, do you have to think about other things besides what's blooming? Do you have to think also about maybe the shape of the flower or the type of the plant uh, in order to entice different kinds of pollinators into your yard? So you do, and I, I would say you don't have to be that scientific about it. Okay. You could be really scientific about it and say, well, a Turk's cap has this whirled flower and you have to get down in there. And if you're a butterfly, you're probably not getting in there. 
<laughs> and if you're a little teeny tiny bee, you're getting in better than a bumblebee. But I think you don't have to engineer it, but you do not want to think about varying it. The more variety you have in the shapes and faces of the flowers, the easier it is for something like a very large butterfly or a really tiny little bee to get in. Um, so you want to have some variety and also know that your pollinators so, some, sometimes duke it out. Mm-hmm. Like I've got this, this mealy blue sage that is beloved by long-eared car- carpenter bees and they keep the mason bees and many of the butterflies and the hum- humming bees, they defend it during the time of year that they're really interested in the food. So you want to think about having a variety of different kinds of flowers. That's fascinating. That's yeah. fascinating. And it's also more enticing to the eye if you're going to be having year-round blooms. Having different kinds of things is more enticing to you as well. So that's, that's true. That's a lot of fun. It's true. It's interesting. When you take aim at other species, making this work for pollinators, for example, it's interesting how you know, you're a part of nature too, and it works for you too. It makes something visually appealing. Should we just be thinking wildflowers? Or I've noticed that there are definitely different kinds of bushes that work. And are there any trees that are enticing to pollinators? So yeah, almost all of our, almost every plant has a flower. And so that's a kind of cool thing to know, which Ah. means that pretty much everything you have there is working at some level, okay? <laughs> and um, and so, of course, you can buy pollinator wildflower mixes, and what makes them pollinator wildflower is, is they're designed to bloom as much year-round as flowers can. Uh-huh. So the bigger the plant, the deeper the root system, the more robust it is for producing flowers in inclement weather and that sort of thing. So you've got your wildflowers doing the best they can. Help them out. Put in some vines that are scrambling over things. Um, Use some shrubs, like for example, we've got a native agarita shrub, right? Mm. It's it's a very uh, very easy to grow, very drought tolerant. It's got a pretty leaf. You can cut it off and make wreaths at the holidays. Well, it has lovely. Um, edible berries, edible by people, edible by birds. Well, it has a very inconspicuous yellow flower in the spring. Well, that's a super tough plant. And in in drought, it's a shrub that's going to continue to flower even if your wildflowers are languishing. Um, Another one to be aware of is your mesquite trees. You think, oh yeah, we got a lot of mesquite trees. (laughs) Well, almost nothing is blooming in July and August. When it's re- when it's a hundred degrees, wow. your mesquite trees are carrying the day, and my mesquite trees are filled with damselflies and honeybees and bumblebees and Lord knows what in the summer when nothing else is blooming, and so. It's, yeah, think about the flowers as you think about all, uh, your trees. A, and, I have yeah. heard another beekeeper say that, you know, having mesquites in their area was something that uh, they wanted to do because they were so much more drought tolerant and they kept food available for their bees when nothing else was available. Yeah, absolutely. They can keep blooming when other things can't. And That's so they've amazing. saved the day for my bees too. So when we think about that, we, we think about beautiful flowers throughout the year. And I know spring brings ideas of flowers that are probably more European than necessarily native. Like, you know, I think tulips, I was up in the East for a while while I went to school and tulips were huge, but they aren't necessarily friendly to our local pollinators, are they? Yeah, that's true. So so the pollinators evolved to eat the native plants that mm-hmm. are around. And so if you put in tulips, you'll get this wonderful floral display for a very short time. <laughs> Not only well, the, the plant, first of all, the plants I think like a tulip and you come up out of the ground and you look around here at the hill country and you think, this ain't Holland, right? <laughs> That's very And true. you kind of shrink back into the ground a lot, right? So they're not terribly really robust, true. but also as the pollinators... I don't recognize this as food. This is a funny shape and it doesn't smell right and it's just not what I'm I'm gonna be eating. And so what you wanna do if you wanna if you look at the plants and you don't know if you have native plants look and see what's on them. Mm -hmm. If you have white prickly poppy, you know this poppy that's it's got like little crepe paper petals yeah. and it come, it blooms right after the blue bonnets in the spring and it's got a yellow center. Whenever I look in those poppies, something's in there. Mysterious, un, you know, insects unknown to me. Well, these are wonderful sources of pollen and nectar. And how do I know? Because I look in the restaurant, there's people in the chairs. It's sort of like, you know, who has the good food is like who has the parking lot that's full. And you'll no one's crawling on the tulips because they're, they're not from here. That's so, so interesting yeah. when you think about it is that you don't want to get rid of the insects in your in your flowers. You want to keep them there because they're the whole point of it. And, yeah. I mean, the whole balance of it and the whole cycle of it is what you want to have. Yeah. 
they're the bellwether species, right? Because oh. our insects are very delicate. They're the bellwether species for the, the health of your little micro ecosystem in your yard. So the more you see them, the better. And I'd encourage you if you don't know your insects well, and I don't, take pictures, get a tripod and take pictures oh. of the little crawly things in your flowers. And they stop being those yucky gnats and they start being this fascinating thing with the elongated body and the orange on the legs and the weird little hairs. And you think, what is this? And it sends your curiosity, sends you on a quest that makes you more familiar with your own little environment. Oh, how fun. That's really fun. And so we're looking at native plants. Are there different ones like this time of year? We're in Texas's version of winter. So are there certain things that we could have be thinking about just in general for um, for winter? So winter's a challenging season, right? Because really the first hard freeze shuts down all the flowers. Mm-hmm. We've had a couple of light freezes, at least where I am in DOS, mm-hmm. the freezes have been light. And so I still have flowers out. My pollinators are looking, but they're <laughs> finding some cow pan daisies and they're finding a little autumn sage and they're finding a little bit to, to nosh on. Um, when we get our first hard freeze, the flowers are gone. And so you want to think about what are the first things back up after uh-huh. a hard freeze. And so what one of the first things back up for us starting in January, we start to get tube tongue. It's a little tiny, um, it's a little tiny ground cover. It's hardly visible. It's lav- It has a lavender flower that's yes. got three. It's like trillium is it's yes. called. It's got the little three. Well, so that's what is one of the first things out there. And at the end of January, my bees are out there. Um, another one I could recommend, which is a not a native, but a lot of people grow it as in their kitchen garden, if you will, is rosemary. People keep that for cooking. And in January, it's got a tough woody stem. And in January, those blooms start coming out. So think about one of the earliest bloomers. We have a lot of plants like our autumn sage that'll bloom all the way to the first hard freeze. But what comes up in January and February, those are those are tough to find. So that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, wow. And now that you've told me what some of those are, I just I these just sort of are there in our yard. But I don't think about I could actually cultivate them and make it a friendlier place for them. Yeah, or just not pull them out. This is you true. know, if you just think of them as a friend, like your garden without any other effort other than this mental shift feels richer, mm-hmm. right? And more nurturing to you. Yes, yes, yeah. that's very true. So yeah. what's the next thing we should be thinking about when we're thinking pollinators at this time of year? Well, let's see. So we talked a little bit about um, thinking about um, the food sources Another thing to think about is the source of water. Mm-hmm. I mean, just like us, we need we need food and we need water and we need shelter. And so the pollinators need a source of water. Mm-hmm. And you want to establish it as a dependable source all year round. For us, we have, like right now, there's water in the creek. So we don't really need extra water. Mm-hmm. But we keep some fountains going and some little ponds that we dug out mm-hmm. so that they know where it is. They're not having to frantically look for water when the creek dries up like it did for us in July Mm -hmm. and was dry for several months. That's really interesting. And and so you talked to last week about some ponds create are created naturally when your animal does some digging. Like if Mm -hmm. your pet Mm -hmm. dog or cat goes out there, just don't don't fill those back in. Let them fill with water as the natural rains come. Well, that, and of course, if your if your soil is sandy, the water won't sit in Mm. there very long. Yeah. And so many of us have livestock tanks or Mm -hmm. some sort of trough. That's something to think about. uh, There's an issue with troughs, which is they tend to be Mm steep-sided. And so if you think about, well, I'm a little damselfly and I'm (laughs) going to try to get down in there, well, I can't get out. Ah. So think about how they're going to get in and out. And it doesn't take, it's not rocket science. You just like think like a bug. How would I get in and out? And you create some sort of a slope. You can, Ah. in your trough, you could pile up rocks that come up above the water line and then birds and bees and whatever and frogs can come and get down to the water and get out Um, or you can float a piece of wood in there or you can construct a pond like we've constructed a little a little pond it's rubber lined Uh and it's got maybe 300 gallons and it's pretty small but um, but it's got an it's got a way for creatures, large and small, to crawl in and out. That's and very so, cool. Yeah. I love the little, uh, uh, their own little, what is it, pontoon with a little bit of wood in there. A so little pontoon. Yeah. It's, it's just That's fine. That's adorable. So, yeah, you want to do that. And then you want to make sure the water stays clean. Mm-hmm. And if it's fresh and circulating, it's good. And also the sound of the water in motion can attract birds and insects. Ah. So if you have a little bubbler or a little fountain on it, as part of your circulation, 
yeah, they can help the Very creatures cool. find you. Yeah. So what's what's next in th- thinking about it? We've done water. Um, should we think about shelters as well? Yeah. Well, so um, sure. You're of course, if you have a European honey beehive, okay. you have there's different kinds of shelters that you can provide, but they basically are mimicking. For the bee purposes, they're mimicking a hollow log, which is probably where your bees would be. Mm -hmm. Um, For your native bees, you can buy native bee houses and butterfly houses, and they look like little tubes of bamboo all clumped together. Ah, yes. So, have you seen Uh those? Okay, and and the butterfly houses look like little slots, like like you drop a little coin in them, like a slot for a piggy bank. I've never seen those. Where they go in and out. Okay, that's a fun thing. So you can buy them. Um, If you have um, acreage property. You probably don't need to do this. Okay. If you have them in your yard, they're living somewhere. Okay. And so you can just kind of make sure that there's a safe place for them. If you have cedar fence posts anywhere on your property or nearby your property, they, they're filled with little tiny holes and little tiny slots that... Ah, um, okay. So I have hung some of the bee and butterfly houses, and some of them get occupied. Like you can look in the little tube and see, <laughs> okay, there's somebody in there. There's some stuff in there. But... Um, but not that much. And we have a lot of cedar posts around. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's and, really but there's neat. a little bit you can do for shelter. Um, cool. But so, a lot of it, it, they figure it out themselves if you've got the right environment going on in your, in your right. yard or in your acreage. Very right, cool. right, exactly. Let's say we've done all of these things, um, but sometimes things go wrong. What's our next step? Do we need a, a, a a backup plan or so you always need a backup plan anyone who has gardened for more than one year knows they need a backup plan and you need it for everything um you know when you throw out seeds they're not all going to sprout when Mm -hmm. you put in plants they're not all going to grow um you know i have a plan my plan for my pollinators in july and august is my mesquite trees well this past year in drought they they quit blooming mm-hmm. at at the end of July and they started forming mesquite beans which usually don't come up to, for, another, for another month they oh, just wow. started forming the beans earlier well that's creating food for other wildlife but it knocked out my my main plan for my wow. pollinators in August so that had me out in the yard doing a lot more watering than I would normally do in August to stimulate the plants to bloom ah that makes so, sense that makes sense so I have turks cap for example that's there which is a very nice pollinator plant in the spring and fall well it doesn't bloom much in <laughs> in the summer and I was out there with a hose to get it to go so you need a plan you need a backup plan you need a backup backup plan and that means when you're when you're mapping out what what's going to bloom in January in February and March, you don't want to have just one thing. You want to have some overlapping layers. Have three things that you that are blooming in February. Have three things that are blooming in March because things shift back and forth and what you don't want is to have gaps. That's true. And and I like also how you said that the planning doesn't have to be crazy scientific. It's about kind of getting to know your neighbors, as it were, and being friendly with them. Yeah, it is. And the other thing to think about is you're not the only restaurant in town. You have neighbors, <laughs> especially if you're on a city That's lot true. so you can take care of some of the things and your neighbors may be taking care of others of the things and your pollinators are getting from one yard to the next so you can give yourself a break too <laughs> that's really yeah. cool um, you know that said there's another side of that which is they need food year round like mm-hmm. we need food year round it's kind of like our oxygen imagine if you had oxygen 24 hours a day 365 days a year except for the one time where you had a three hour <laughs> gap you're dead right that's right there's you're nothing dead. working there they're, yeah. right and so the same thing is true with your pollinators. They need to be able to eat year round and too long of a gap and they're gone, even if you come ah. back and catch them up later. So, yeah, you can coordinate with your native neighbors, but they, they range far. Like honeybees will range up to a couple of miles. Um, wow. If you want to move your hive and have the honeybees not go back, you got to move it at least three miles. Oh, so wow. they're, go, they're ranging pretty far. So you want to do your best with what you have and understand that your neighbors are doing other things and hopefully not the same thing yeah. as you. Probably not. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. you can build year to year, but make sure that there's people or little insects that'll be coming back every year or being there every year uh, for them to enjoy. Absolutely. What's next on our pollinator agenda? Um, the, you know, the, the other thing to say is that um, we've talked about how to attract them. Mm-hmm. And let's also just cover this one point about not making them go away. Yes. Um, is we're tempted to poison insects. We look at them and we think these are creepy crawly and they're bad. and what poisons one insect poisons 
all the insects. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so if you can be really judicious in your use of poison, mm-hmm. you know, when, when we put out um, fire ant uh, poison in our yard, you know, we lost some birds. Oh, you know, wow. some insect yeah. l- walked across the, the thing and got itself poisoned and the bird ate the thing. And, you know, what they, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I am fond of saying what they taught you in second grade is true, that the whole ecosystem is connected. It's true. And so um, just be really careful in your use of poisons. And the other thing is that the, the, um, your insects look different at different times of life. So you might look on the back of the leaf and think, I've got blight. There's these insects that are there. Well, you those might be next spring's ladybugs. Oh. And then ladybugs go through a stage that's more of a larval stage. And they have this weird long body with dark gray. And yeah. it just, they, they look so weird. And you think, what is this insect? <laughs> it's the larval form of a ladybug. And then comes the little ladybugs that look like the Volkswagen beetles with the little black dots. And you think, yay, here's the ladybugs. Okay, those are all ladybugs. and oh. And so... You don't have to know what they all are, but treat them all as friendlies to the extent that you can. That's excellent. I like that. And I love this for keeping us pollinator friendly throughout the year. Is there something else that we need to be thinking of at this point? Or are we pretty good for our pollinator plan for year round? I think that's a pretty good plan. If you think about the food year round, you think about water year round, you think about shelter year round, and you avoid poisons year round, you're doing pretty well for your pollinators. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. This is really fun um, because it really narrows it down to our area. And I think gives people a little sense of comfort in knowing somebody else that they know has tried these things out and they actually do work uh, yeah, around here. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun to talk to you about pollinators. That's something that's very close to my heart. And I just like to encourage our listeners that you can do this. Yes. You and there's lots yeah. of places around in the Hill Country in Fredericksburg that have native plants and all different kinds of things that you can um, that you can purchase or that you can check with your neighbor and see if they've got a plant that they'll be willing to to let you replant. But there are a lot of native plant friendly places around here that people can purchase from. That's very true. We have a good native plant nursery in Friendly Natives. We do a native plant sale in the spring and the fall Mm -hmm. through the Native Plant Society. And we have an ongoing continual seed swap, Mm -hmm. friendly informal seed swap that happens at many of our meetings. Um, And so, yeah. Okay, cool. And so the next meeting of the Native Plant Society of Texas Fredericksburg chapter is going to be in January. It and is. It is, it is January, it's January 23rd, which is the fourth Tuesday of the month. It's at 630 at 212 West San Antonio Street, thank which you. is St. Joseph's Hall, and it's open to everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Garden Feature, a special feature of KNAFAM 910, where we discuss with local gardeners the tips and ideas for gardening in the hill country. The next Intergenerational Game Day is March 27th at 3.30 at Lano County Library. Talk About the Hill Country wants to remind listeners that libraries are a great resource. Books are only the beginning. Patrons can take workshops on crafts, healthy living, exercise, and much more. Library apps make ebooks and audible books available for free. We have many great libraries here in the KNAF listening area in Fredericksburg, Johnson City, Bernie, Lano, Marble Falls, Brady, Harper, and Mason, to name just a few. Make a visit to the library, one of your fun field trips this week. Talk About the Hill Country is a service of KNAF and HC Broadcasting. If your business or organization has an event or a new service coming up in the days, weeks, or months ahead, contact us to be put on the calendar. Talk About the Hill Country comes on every Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. on KNAF AM 910. Call KNAF at 830-997-2197, fax 830-997-2198, or email knafnews at gmail.com.